greetings. This week I want to talk about um, some books. I want a quick recap of our last message. And then really look at three parts, um, in three sermons, three different parts from Daniel Rowland. I think it would be immensely helpful about the nature of the gospel, putting on Christ, um, the snares of this world, the distractions specifically. So the amount of distractions that Christians had in the 18th century, uh, you'd be amazed how much how much in common right, we have with them. And then uh, justification by faith. And uh, again, I'll try to use a good economy of words. So first on, on books, some encouragement. If you're looking again, to see the New Testament church, right? What you see in Acts being lived out in church history, I would argue the Welsh Calvinistic Methodists are a great example of that. You can buy the two volume books of the Calvinistic Methodist uh, Fathers of Wells from Banner of Truth. It's two volumes. It's um, probably about, about $60. It's, it, it's daunting because you look at these two volumes, you go, man, that's kind of intimidating. But they're the type of books that you can dive in and out of uh, because it's made up of uh, so many biographies. So it, it's almost like mini books within the two volumes. So I, but I think that it's, it's an absolute must read for any, uh, must have for any Christian library. Second is J.C. Rowell's book on the leaders of the 18th century, which includes a biography on Daniel Rowland, which will show how Christ honoring Rowland's preaching is. So much less intimidating, but but the thing about Ryle, too, is he'll talk about the spiritual state before the revival and the nature of revival within the same book. So I think that's really important. And I like the way J.C. Ryle puts it. He, you know, he says, listen, I'm dealing with facts. You know, I mean, he's just just straight up. I'm just I'm dealing with facts. I'm dealing with reality, you know. Um, and what he's dealing with is is how God rent the heavens and came down. As I mentioned, I think between 1735 and 1835. There were six revivals. What that means is that God poured out his spirit, right? God rent the heavens and came down six times. And in both, in both, you know, the, the two volume set in J.C. Ryle's book on the 18th century Christian leaders, what you're going to find is how spiritually dark it was. But then God moved, and that would be a great encouragement. And then often, you know, Christian ladies are overlooked, you know, in advancing God's kingdom. They're foot soldiers um, in the gospel as well. And so, um, Selena, uh, Countess of Huntington, a biography printed by Banner of Truth, which was uh, really um, important to the oldest daughter of Martin Lloyd Jones, Lady Catherwood. So, I would highly recommend uh, that biography. She's an amazing Christian woman, close friends with George Whitfield and the Wesley brothers, and yes, the Welsh Methodist leaders like Daniel Rowland and William Williams and Hal Harris. And she started a reformed seminary in Wells. She planted over 64 chapels, I think Wells and other places, printed Bibles and hymnals and paid for school teachers to uh, for, to learn, teach children and adults how to read because the devil did a very good job in keeping people ignorant. Um, she paid for missionary trips and supported ministers, and she was just concerned about the salvation of all people. She just had a sweet evangelical spirit. She was concerned about everyone, and she put her money to use to advance God's kingdom. Um, just incredibly, um, just, just incredibly, a strong Christian woman, and so I highly recommend that biography. And they will all give you insights, again, to these uh, wonderful example of Welsh Calvinistic Methodists. Now understand, I don't view this as a Welsh thing. You know, in other words, like I'm not promoting, what you know, I mean, think about, you know, uh, Spurgeon and the Puritans that the English have given us. You think about France, you know, with Calvin and, and Luther with Germany. I mean, I mean, oh my goodness. I mean, you know, the, the, the Christian church is just full of godly uh, powerful Christian communities and leaders. And I'm just pointing out as we go through this is that, well, guess what? Yeah, <laughs> you know, Wells has something wonderful to offer us as well uh, to learn from. And not just as an academic exercise, but that we would persevere to this very day and we would stand with Christ and finish our race, race strong. Okay, in the last message, I was pointing out the hazards of success. 
So what happens? Well, persecution comes. You know, so Welsh ministers indeed were arrested. They were beaten. They were put on trial. They were shot at, and and uh, the horrible things were said about them. And so there was persecution. But there's also the hazard of success of what happens with the flesh. And the example I gave is you have a Bible study, and you're just hoping somebody shows up. You're just hoping your wife shows up. You know, you got to force your kids to come down, that kind of thing. And then all of a sudden, God gives you 30 people, 60 people. You know, what do you do with that? And the amount of pressure that puts on. So imagine now you got thousands. Here's Daniel Rowland preaching in Legaitha Wells, village maybe of a couple hundred. And you got thousands to come and hear you every weekend. This went on for 55 years. So at the very beginning, undoubtedly, based on some of the prayers that we're reading, there was some battle with the flesh. Because a good definition of unbelief is having confidence in the flesh and not in the spirit. Let me say that again. Especially if you're an American Christian. Especially if you're a wealthy Christian living anywhere. A good definition of unbelief is having confidence in the flesh and not in the spirit. I'm not suggesting have more confidence in the spirit and less confidence in the flesh. That's not, that's not scriptural. The Bible says, Apostle Paul says, I have no confidence in the flesh. No confidence. So one of, our, one of the ways that we grieve God and we could see our spiritual state and how weak we are in the faith is we have so much confidence in our flesh, in ourselves. So undoubtedly, that was a challenge, again, for all of them, you know, it, it's just, it is natural, right? And so what can we take from that? Well, as Christians, uh, sin no longer reigns in us, but we can choose to sin. We can choose to trust in our flesh. We can choose to strip, shipwreck our faith and fall into unbelief, right? You can choose to do that. So what we learn from Daniel Rowland and the way people were praying for him is he sought after God. He didn't try to hide his sin. He went to God with it. And that's what the Calvinistic Methodists do. They go to God. They're transparent. They're healthy Christians. So there's no games of trying to figure out, like coming across as living this you know perfect Christian life. No, no, no. They know how to put to death sin. They know how to repent of it to acknowledge it, to see where it comes from. So to see the true state of it and the wickedness of it, to not play with sin. Because ultimately what sin does, it causes us to fall into unbelief. And it's unbelief that condemns the soul, right? That's not, that's not what, that's what we read, right? In John 3, chapter 3, yes. So understanding how to deal with the flesh and put sin to death is so important. And the first step of that is bringing it out in the light and confessing it to our Heavenly Father, for He is faithful to forgive us. So, um, so that's the quick recap. Now I want to look at three sermons. The first one deals with the nature of the gospel. Now this is from Dan, uh, Hal Harris reporting notes about Daniel Rowland's preaching on February 13th in the year 1742. And it says that Roland was preaching from Revelation 3.18, and here's the scripture. It says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you may become rich in white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Well, Roland began by reminding his congregation that it was when Apostle Paul had been banished that God granted him a revelation. And from this, Roland drew encouragement and warning. When we are despised by all, then God values us. And when the world admires us, we are mean before God, Roland says. Then Roland would go on to deal with the very nature of the gospel. And I want to make a point. But this is what Roland says. God's advising does not imply a power in men. For God's hand and word go together. 
He exhorts to come and draw us to. As we call our beast, we draw them to the rope. By buying, he means it's meant receiving or exchanging in the gospel to give our misery for his happiness. Okay, let me stop here. What I simply want to point out, the way Roland begins with the gospel call, is salvation is a mystery. I mean, I could spend a lot of time on the nature of man, right? The, the exceeding sinfulness of sin and the deception of sin and how we're dead in our sins, okay? But the point that I want to make is that you see within scriptures that God is calling, but he also draws, and the reason this is important is, is the sense that I get in talking with individuals is there is no need to be born again. So Protestant Christians, evangelical Christians, are acting as if they're Muslims, or acting as if they're Roman Catholics. There's just certain things that I need to do, right? They're treating Christianity as if it's a form of application. Just tell me what you want me to do and I'll go do it as if there's no need to be born again. I can live the Christian life without being born again, right? And that's heresy, that's a lie, that's not true, okay? And because, and that's where I think the, the great deception is, is believing that somehow man has an innate ability, the way Roland puts it, God's advising does not imply a power in men, that we simply can make a decision to follow Christ. Again, the definition of a Christian is the life of God in the soul of a man, woman, or child. So what I'm suggesting is that we're living in an age where everyone's focused on application, right? right? My, my behavior, right? How am I living? What am I doing? What am I saying? How am I believing? Am I orthodox? Where what the Welsh are reminding us, which is what the Bible tells us, is... It's our nature is the problem. We have to be born again. So looking at Christianity as if you're just selecting a sports team, you know, this is my team, the Christian team, and I'm put on the Christian jersey, and I'm going to do the Christian things. But there is no need to be born again. My nature doesn't need to change because I've already have the implied power to come to God. When in reality, what the scriptures teach us is that salvation is a mystery. It's a mystery. God speaks life into existence. That's what Genesis tells us. He wills it. He speaks it. Can you explain to me how that happens? No. You just know that God did it. Can you tell me how God takes out a heart of stone and replaces it with a heart of flesh? That the, the life of God is... is, is put into the soul of a man, woman, or child? That you have new affections, new desires? You see things in a new way? There is a new birth. Can you tell me how the Spirit of God does that? No, I can't. He just does. He's God. And so to orbit around the church, to even be a pastor or an elder or deacon or a wife, of a pastor, elder, or deacon, to orbit around the church, to be a long-standing member, in good standing, by the way, to be a pillar of the Christian community, but spend eternity in hell. I have to tell you, there is no reason for that to happen. It's not a trage tragedy to live 30 years as a, as a Christian when in reality you're a non-Christian because you've never been born again. And, you, and, and you're hearing this message, and it's like, like, fingernails on the chalkboard right um and then you wonderfully come to to, to faith in christ you become born again because you you see the folly of this right and you go wow you know god wasted or i wasted the last 30 years because i i was faking it you know well no you didn't god was still god god is god before your salvation god is god at the point of salvation god is god after salvation the only travesty is dying in your sins. That's only travesty. So what the Puritans remind us and great preachers like a Bunyan or a Spurgeon or, or you know, you, you look at a Luther or you look at a Calvin, 
they're all reminding us that you have to be born again. And Daniel Rowland, in, in just explaining the nature of the gospel, that it is a power of God, that our salvation rests on the power of God, not on the wisdom of men, as Apostle Paul puts it to the Corinthian church. So I think this is important to understand. Notice I'm not spending time trying to argue about man's depravity and being dead in sins. I mean, that's all true. But what I want to emphasize is the necessity to be born again. These preachers went around and said, you're in trouble. There's a holy God and you're a sinner. And this God has called you to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. All that Christ has said, all that he has done, and all that he will do, and that he was resurrected on the third day, and that he indeed is the Son of God. And Roland is going to say here, by buying, what is it that we're exchanging? What? Right? Our misery, our sins, for his happiness, for his righteousness. There is this exchange. That simply by believing in Christ, that God saw fit to give us a gift. And that gift is Christ's righteousness. So again, I can't, I'll say it a million times more, the Calvinistic Methodists orbit around Christ. They would never make themselves the central character. So they, where we may start with the condition of our own, or of ourselves, about what we're doing, about what we're thinking, about what we're believing, the Welsh Calvinistic Methodists, like healthy Christians, always look on to Christ. They started with Christ. Because, again, even you'll be able to see your sins on the cross, you know. Look to the cross. Look to Christ. Look at all that he has accomplished. And that will give, you, give us biblical assurance. Now, in the, second, in the second sermon, he's going to say, let me turn there now, he's going to say that... Um, uh, when um, in First John uh, two two he says, and he is the appropriation for our sins, and not only ours, but for the sins of the whole world. Roland dealt certainly with the real character of saving faith, saying that the apostle John here we are preaching to the heart, calling them to see God's love. Okay, and this is what he's saying: true ministers. This is part of the sermon now. True ministers must preach so that all people may know where they are going and be most sure of either heaven or hell. Let me say it again. True ministers must preach so that all people may know where they are going and be more sure of either heaven or hell. It, it is a travesty to see ministers leading people on a bridge to nowhere, simply helping people manage their sins and making better decisions in their life. That is, not the nature, the, that is not the nature of the gospel. The gospel is calling sinners to repentance, to, new, to believe in Jesus Christ, to be born again. All right? All right? I got news for you. You're not always going to be a husband. You're not always going to be a wife. You're not always going to be raising children. All right? The question is, is what is your true state in relationship with God? That's what's important. We must, all those other things are important too, but we must begin with the basics. It, it is, it, it's ridiculous. A bridge to nowhere where you're doing all these Christian things. You've got the Christian shirt and you die in your spend, sins and spend eternity in hell. And this is at the point where you might say, hey, John, you're a jerk, you know. Well, why? Because I make you feel uncomfortable? When you read about the Welsh Calvinistic Methodists, you know what they do? They make, you, they make us feel uncomfortable. I mean, as challenging as you find this, perhaps, I find it as equally challenging. These things speak to my heart. But this is true Christianity. This is what Christianity is about. True ministers must preach so that people may know where they are going, be most sure of either heaven or hell. It is sinful, it is cruel to keep people comfortable in their sins, even though they're attending church. And he'll go on to say, the inside of God's people is the best in all ages. It is not 
our grace and holiness God praises in the Song of Solomon. But our imputed righteousness, the best part of the saint, is inside. Righteousness imputed is like the sun. Thereon God looks, hence is the sure foundation of a witness. But sanctification is like the moon, changeable, so that the witness arising hence is uncertain. At this point, Roland touches on on Harris' favorite theme, which is what? Assurance, right? Because remember, that was part of their debate theologically, trying to understand biblical assurance. But this is the point of what Roland is saying here. He's saying, listen, the best part of us is Christ's righteousness, which has been imputed to us as a gift. That righteousness that's been imputed, justification by faith, is rock solid, unchangeable, done, accomplished, period. It is like the sun. All right? Our sanctification is like the moon that changes. All right? Our sanctification has has ups, it has downs, it has real consequences. Don't get me wrong. But our justification is rock solid. We are saved by the blood of the Lamb. It is the blood that covers us. So, The reason why we struggle, one of the reasons why we struggle as Christians, and and people may be listening to this hundreds of years from now, but is we're using justification by faith in order to manipulate people in order to behave better. And so even when justification by faith is preached, at some point there's always some manipulation many times that comes into the sermon. Because right away the ministers are going... You know, but that, but shall we continue in sin? You know, because we've been justified. You know, just hold on. Paul got there too. But Paul spent four chapters on justification by faith before he got there. Maybe five chapters, right? Spent a lot of time understanding what God has done for us. And our justification in Christ is rock solid. But the problem is, we're always looking at ourselves. That's the problem. We're not looking onto Christ, are we? We're always grading ourselves. Because you've been graded your whole life. High school, college, your marriage, your job. Right? The idea that we've been justified by faith is too good to be true, right? What, as I've said before, the Bible tells us, you know, you know that you know God's ways don't make sense to us. The ways of man seem right to him, but they lead on to death. The ways of man seem right to him, but they lead on to death. It just makes sense to us that if we do certain holy acts, if we give money, if we live a certain way, we can add to our justification. We can create our justification. And that is not Christianity. It's Roman Catholicism. It's, it's Islam. It has some Hinduism in it. New Age, right? But it's not the gospel. The Bible, Apostle John is clear in his epistles that God wants us to know that we're saved. And to know that we're saved, we have to know the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. And so, yeah, justification by faith, um, just absolutely essential to understand and to be rock solid in that doctrine so that you cannot be deceived by your own heart, by the devil, or by the world. All right? Now, Roland... In the second or in the third sermon, is going to is going to talk about the distractions of this world, and we'll end with this. God is a sea; the ordinances are the pipes. Lukewarmness and wandering thoughts are like stones that interrupt the channel. You shiver with cold when God is fire. You are hungering with famine, and Christ is all food. You are thirsty, and He is water to refresh you. Come up then near to God, and don't stand off. Lukewarmness is a wound, and wandering thoughts are like the vermin that blow on it to make it stink. 
You begin with hearing and praying with God, but soon you go from God, wandering from God. And he'll go on to say, it takes us from our duty and the benefits of his ordinances and the comfort of his love. And so he'll, he'll, he'll go on. But here's what I want to point out. There's a couple things that he says here. Number one is we need to understand and not run to this world. Because this world is like Babel, right? Which is just the land of confusion. And God is in Salem, which is the city of peace. So when we wander from God, we are wandering into Satan's camp, which is Babel. It is Babylon, right? And um, it, it's a confusing and hostile place, right? When we wander from God, Daniel Rowland put it this way. He says, you know, it's like inviting God's enemies to his banquet table. So when we are committed to sin, when we're committed to a rebellion, living in worldliness, what we're doing is we're inviting God's enemies to his banquet table. So what do you expect God to do? He's going to leave. No, no. God's going to defeat his enemies. He's not inviting them to no banquet. And that's how Daniel Rowland describes what it means to grieve God. So we we need to see this. And, and, and again, it goes back to my point, right, about what is unbelief? Oh, unbelief is relying on the flesh and not the spirit, right? What causes us to fall into unbelief? This wandering away from God. And it is the distractions of this world that causes the wandering. Even back to the 18th century Christians, because you can, it just describes us perfectly today, right? So the spiritual challenges, my argument is, the reason why it's worthwhile to spend time looking at these Calvinistic Methodists is that the spiritual challenges are exactly the same you see it in the Bible, you see it in church history, you're feeling it this very day. But it doesn't have to be this way. So, to wrap up for this week, I think what I want to emphasize is this. Understanding the true nature of the gospel call. All that God has accomplished for us in Christ. That the necessity of being born again and truly resting on justification by faith, which is unchangeable, all right? That it is our nature that is what is important, and that nature will drive our behavior. And that by being strong and healthy Christians, being sanctified by the word of God, we'll be able to see things the way that God sees them and grow in holiness. Because, oh, Roland makes this point in these sermons that the Christian can't do anything but be holy have holy desires, to follow after God. Why? Why? It's organic. Why? Well, because the Spirit of God is within us. God's not going to invite his enemies to his footstool or, you know, to his banquet table. His enemies are going to become his footstool. You know, you know, God who is holy and 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 and, and light, there, there's going to be no darkness. There's going to be there's, there, there, there is no sin within God? No. And likewise with us, uh, uh, Daniel Rowland is going to tell us to put on Christ. And what we see in Romans and Galatians, what that means is, is that our union is with Christ. In other words, we stand with Christ. We, we have said, no, 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 no. We're not standing with the devil. We're not standing with our flesh, our sinful ways. No, no, we're not standing with men. We're not, we're not in Adam's camp anymore. We are with Christ. And then putting on Christ also refers to, in Galatians, it, the, the characteristics of Christ. We, we renounce our self-righteousness. We renounce our lying, deceptive, selfish, self-righteous ways. We were wrong, okay? We confess our sins. We're self-lovers, egotistical, self-righteous, godless, rebellious people. We were wrong, okay? And we confess that. And we look on to Jesus Christ because he is the great mediator. He is the way that can reconcile us back to God. And that's what we hold on to. That's what we hold on to. And now that we're born again, we put on Christ. Our union with Christ, our identification, and the characteristics of Christ so that we can reflect God's glory once again in our lives 
by reflecting our love and our ability to love one another, including those that we disagree with, shows us a great insight to our true spiritual health and the condition of our faith. So let us not then trust in our flesh, but let us walk by the Spirit, for that's what God has called us to do. Until next week, grace upon grace be with you all.